Hey everyone, welcome to the Cinco de Mayo edition of AI News Drama and Updates. It is the first week of May and there is just an absolute ton to talk about in the AI space. I wanted to start here today. We have a leaked document apparently from Google. This isn't something I've personally verified. I don't know much about semianalysis.com where this is at. This paragraph explains this came from a public discord. This has been verified by semianalysis, I guess, and this is the document supposedly in its entirety that they don't necessarily agree with. So I wanted to start there and then dig into what's actually in this document. And what it is basically is a longer list of accomplishments, just a lot of things that have happened in the AI space. A lot of those you're probably familiar with, especially if you've been following this channel from week to week. It really does give you an idea of how far we've come and how quickly. It seems like the overall idea, the premise of the document, is that a Google internal employee is looking at what they've built with BARD, they're looking at their competition in terms of OpenAI, and they're also aware that the open source world is just killing it. We were there for the Llama release, and then just two weeks later we had Alpaca, and then just a week after that, Vicuna. And you can see here on the chart side by side how it compares to BARD and ChatGPT. It's basically almost there. So while this goes into what happened, why we could have seen it coming, what we missed, yada yada, it seems again like the big takeaway here is that open source will eventually overtake everything that we're doing here. What we're doing for tens of millions of dollars, these guys are out here doing on a phone. You know, that type of vibe. And now I know I probably have a ton of viewers that aren't super familiar with the open source world. You know, Linux and Apache and a lot of things that basically run the world around us. Because they aren't just good alternatives, they're better alternatives than the big things that exist. You know, Windows certainly isn't the best operating system, it's just the most common. Linux overtakes it in a number of different areas. And that's just one of many examples. And of course, I think the other big takeaway here is that Google seems really hyper-focused on OpenAI being the competition, which it is, but it's not the only competition. And it seems like here, at least there's some sentiment that OpenAI is probably also going to be overtaken eventually by this open source world as well. And also on the topic of time in the future, the godfather of AI has apparently left Google amid ethical concerns. Now, I will say this is a big story, and I saw it covered in a lot of different ways by a lot of different media companies. It seems like a lot of different media companies had a very different take on it. I did want to show you that this ex-VP of Google, he's gone to Twitter to maybe clarify a couple of things. You know, this one is a good example. Canada's AI pioneer Jeffrey Hinton says AI could wipe out humans. In the meantime, there's money to be made. You know, Jeffrey has pointed out that a couple of these headlines have been very dishonest or misleading, kind of filling his mouth with words he didn't exactly say. But it seems like with Jeffrey's takeaway, AI leaves a lot of questions. There's a lot of unknowns, and if there's one thing that we are scared of is the unknown. I feel like it's human nature to try to control the things that we can't control, or at least to the best of our ability. So this is one thing that is going to leave a lot of questions, and it's going to certainly raise some flags with a lot of people. But I do want to address, as someone who myself saw the internet kind of grow up, saw computers become more commonplace, and saw the world change, not necessarily collapse, not only can I tell you for sure that there were a lot of concerns about computers replacing people, or internet, but that this guy should know that. And I think at this point in time, it's harder to say that the technological revolution shouldn't have happened. Did the economy collapse? Maybe a little bit, but you know what? Capitalism bounced back, and a lot of people ended up fully employed. In fact, we have less unemployment now than ever before, right? So I keep seeing headlines with fear-mongering stuff about AI eliminating jobs. I see companies like IBM basically just laying off people and saying, yeah, AI is eventually going to replace their jobs. They're just blaming it on AI, but that's not actually the reason these people are losing jobs. In cases like that, it's just capitalism. It's just greed. Now, he did make it clear on Twitter that Google wasn't doing anything that he felt was unethical. So I did want to make that clear here, just in case that was a takeaway that anyone did have. And while there's certainly some talking points here that I do agree with, I do feel that AI does contribute to things like misinformation. I don't think that it's going to be more misinformation than what we would have been subjected to before. I think it's just easier and more efficient to get those things done now. He's quoted here as saying, you may not be able to know what's true anymore. And I just want to point out that long before AI, there were still people thinking the Earth was flat. This planet is full of people with different varying belief systems that contradict each other. I would say that we don't know what's true right now. And that AI might actually give us some insight on what is actually true in the future. We don't know that either. You know, I think a lot of hyper-focus is on potential negative consequences when there's a lot of potential positive consequences we haven't even considered. So that's my take on it. Maybe I'm a glass half full guy, but I'll leave this story on that note and move on. And if you're at all worried about AI, you know, causing nuclear war, 
I got great news. We're putting laws in place so that AI can't launch nuclear missiles. Now, maybe like me, you read this headline and you're like, oh, I didn't know that was even going on. Um, yeah, so I don't have any top secret access or anything like that, but I have no idea how real of a threat this actually was, but Congress took it upon themselves to start setting up laws about putting into place things to stop AI-controlled nuclear launches in the future. They think this is going to be a way of protecting the people of the future. You know, it's a unique and I think interesting assumption that the AI would be more likely to launch a nuclear missile. This may be yet another instance of what would we do with that kind of power? Maybe we would misuse it. And on the other hand, we have the memory of like what the Bing bot did in its first couple of weeks and how it just went friggin' buck wild. So yeah, that probably wouldn't be great either. So maybe this is a great move. Time will tell. Marching into the world of GPT, we're talking about AI in the world of writing, professional writing. And you may have heard that the Writers Guild of America went on strike recently. One of the biggest demands that they had that a lot of people aren't super familiar with is that they are not looking forward to having AI involved in future writing projects. And from what I understand, the people they're striking against aren't really even approaching that conversation, not coming to the table. You know, as I saw this strike taking place, and I'm also keeping a very close eye on GPT technology, how far it's coming, how quickly, it does occur to me that this is really one of the last chances that the writers are going to have to make this kind of move before this technology is just too common. One of the biggest issues, unfortunately, with something like this, though, is we may see restrictions get put in place for some of these big companies like BARD or OpenAI, but there's nothing that can stop the open source stuff that we talked about earlier. You know, as something like Vicuna continues to get better and better, for example, what's to stop someone from using it? These are open source projects that aren't regulated and they're not controlled by companies. AI tech isn't just a one type of thing where you can just turn it on and off. You can't just overall regulate every form of machine learning. We've got different forms of this stuff on phones and different mobile devices now. It's kind of everywhere. And just like a war on drugs, it's kind of like stopping a concept. You can't just stop AI. So while I completely understand the demands and the fear behind, you know, the, the inclusion of GPT involved in writing and things like that, it is going to be interesting to see how this plays out and how ultimately this gets resolved. You know, and I do hope that the Writers Guild isn't on strike for an extended period of time because this does seem a very difficult situation to work out. But a little bit more news in the ChatGPT world. It looks like Italy is back in the fold with the new changes to ChatGPT that we talked about last week with privacy concerns being addressed. Apparently the service is back up and running in Italy, but out of the frying pan and into the fire because Samsung employees had apparently been using ChatGPT tech to work on internal code. But some recent data leaks at OpenAI revealed some security concerns. And so Samsung across the board has just banned GPT service, actually barred as well. I think with the new features that OpenAI added, like being able to turn off the training, it does lessen the security concern that Samsung would have had. But if you got a Samsung employee dropping the internal code in there, if GPT were able to train off of that at any point, it could spit that out later for someone else. And so that's where this kind of decision comes from. And we'll have to see how this plays out, but I have a good feeling that it's going in this direction. So Microsoft is basically putting aside a service where they're going to go to businesses directly and offer private versions of ChatGPT, for example. They could go to Samsung and they could offer them a unique gated in version of GPT that would do all of the things that GPT-4 could do, but they wouldn't have the security issues. You know, and if they go that route, there wouldn't be a chance of an outside person being able to access internal code and creating this whole security risk. So while this headline doesn't initially make a lot of sense, when you think about the companies and the focus that they have on keeping their internal intellectual property safe, this is definitely something that I think a lot of companies are going to consider. Now, private instances of GPT would allow for additional options too. We won't really cover that here. But even touching on some of the technologies that were addressed in that letter we started today's video with, I mean, these internalized versions of GPT could basically be trained specific to the company, and they could give company-specific responses, for example. We have to remember, Microsoft invested billions and billions of dollars to get this kind of technology into their hands. And at the time, that seemed like an absolutely wild move. But, and this is just my opinion, that does seem like they've made a lot of correct moves in trying to monetize this in the right way. And it's probably something that a lot of companies are going to think about as a safer alternative to something that's more public. Now for something a little fun, a little interesting. Mr. Elon Musk's face again graces my channel, where a judge has now knocked back a ridiculous claim. Let me try this one on. I can't remember, Your Honor. It might have been a deep fake.
According to this article, that is the defense that Elon and his lawyers are going for in this Tesla crash autopilot AI issue. Yeah, Elon Musk is probably one of the only people on the planet that has a website dedicated to stuff that he said that will never come true or hasn't come true just yet. But this case, this lawsuit, and more importantly, this defense may be something that we start to see more of. You know, there is something to the idea that deep fakes can be used, and we're going to start seeing more of them. That is going to be a more common defense than we've seen it ever previously before. Now, obviously, and hopefully in this case, it gets seen right through. But in the cases where it's a real situation, that might be a very different story. The exact quote is right here. It says, Musk, like many public figures, is the subject of many deep fake videos and audio recordings that purport to show him saying and doing things that he never actually said or did. And yeah, deepfakes did exist, you know, six years ago when this video was recorded, but it's still a very wild claim, and honestly, it just seems kind of desperate. As a really quick fun thing in the world of AI art, in case you missed it, there was a viral video of a beer commercial that is generated completely by AI. And you could see that a lot of the individual pieces, the individual images, are fine, like, by themselves. But when you play them together, it just, you can start to see, it gets really wrong. So yeah, while writers are worried about their jobs, I think the people making commercials are uh, still pretty secure for the time being. Let's uh, let's move on to the world of Deep Floyd. Now this is a stability AI purchase. What it seems like is that they're just purchasing up different technologies that are tangentially related to what they do. And I think the idea here is to hopefully give their Dream Studio tool more and more options to kind of let it stand out. Text has always been one of those big issues and problems within AI-generated art because of the way that it gets kind of trained in. So you, you have some images here as examples of what this Deep Floyd technology can do, and it looks like it can generate text within a latent diffusion space. Now, these images look great. The problem is I don't know how many times we have to generate before we can get this level of quality. I don't know how much post-processing might have been done. So it's hard for me to speak on this as if this is just going to happen every time. I don't pretend to fully understand every aspect of machine learning, but based on what I read, it seems like it uses a different series of steps to generate an image. So while it might be able to do text a little bit better, by itself it doesn't do as well with the graphic fidelity. And so maybe that's kind of the direction they're going for, combining that with Stable Diffusion XL to potentially create an even better graphic than what you might be used to seeing. And of course, if they can achieve that goal, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that. More competition in this space is always a great thing. Now, here we have a newer headline. This is less than a day ago, so we probably haven't seen the fallout of this yet. But it looks like Blizzard has sought out a patent for an AI system to make art for its games. And once gamers get wind of this, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of fallout. If you haven't heard already, apparently the developers of System Shock put out a screenshot that utilized Midjourney, and that put some gamers into enough of a hissy fit that they canceled their pre-orders. So we'll have to see if they do the same with a company like Blizzard. If you want my take on something like this, I think it's great. I really do. I think the only reason we're seeing this as a controversy is because this is art related and because of all of the people that have already been up in arms about AI art. But you ask these same gamers about how they feel about chat GPT modifications where NPCs are able to communicate with them, holding on to context information. I don't think the issue here is machine learning being integrated. It's just that credit for art artists and developers. I think a lot of the anger comes from huge assumptions that are being made that may or may not even be true. You know, for example, if they think that this is going to replace artists, that may not even happen. Maybe the worlds they're going to design will be 10 to 15 times bigger because of how quickly and how much more efficiently they're able to get stuff done. If you go into a 3D modeling program, something like Blender or Maya, and you just decide to create a, a 3D model of like a house, go for it. You'll see how much work it actually is. And if you imagine how much time you could save through textures being generated or things of that nature, you'll start to see the advantage of this type of stuff within your workflow, not necessarily replacing you. And I think there's a lot of artists that do understand that, and people who aren't necessarily within the industry are the ones who are getting upset. And that brings us into talking about AI in the future. You know, Hugging Face and Big Code, which is something that I talked about ages ago, it feels like, uh, they finally did release a model, which is a free code generating model. I did have a chance to play with this a little bit. It's called Star Coder, 
And you can use it directly on Hugging Face if you want to just chat with it, but you can also install it, I guess, as an extension similar to GitHub and how Copilot works. While I honestly can't claim I know a ton about big code, I know that one of the founding principles behind everything they put together was ethics. And it looks here like they even have an option for developers to opt out, which is something, to my knowledge, I haven't seen outside of the AI art space. So very interesting, and if you're a coder, probably very much worth checking out. Wanted to talk briefly about the headline, not so much the content of this particular article. And this seems to be really just reinforcing the sentiment that I continue to have for Microsoft, which is they're just putting everything. Their entire future of their company seems to be in the hands of generative AI, which if I'm being honest, I'm a little bit more assured by because it seems like the government is now getting hyper involved with VP Harris actually meeting with Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, you know, and talking with them about the moral responsibilities behind these safeguards and things like that. According to her statement, private firms have an ethical, moral, and legal responsibility to make their products safe and secure. But I say all that to say that this was immediately before the Biden administration invested $140 million to launch seven new national AI research institutes. So it would seem like this meeting was about safety and it was about security, but it was also about funding these AI research institutes and getting commitment from each of those companies that they were going to play their part in this upcoming role. They're going to have a public evaluation of AI systems. And also, I think they're trying to draft policies for federal employees dealing with AI, that kind of stuff. You can see the list of companies here, Anthropic, Google, Hugging Face, Microsoft, NVIDIA, OpenAI, and Stability AI, uh, to participate in this DEF CON 31 evaluation. I feel like ages ago when we talked about this AI Bill of Rights in October. And while I could see this applying to companies, registered business owners, and things like that, it leaves a lot of questions for those of us who are training things on our own. And it's an interesting thing to have these talks here and now while we're seeing the open source alternatives do such amazing things. The names of those companies, the CEOs of those companies, they don't control the future of AI. We do. The people in the open source world, the people who are building models, the people actually making use of this technology will be the ones to set the tone for how it gets used in the future. So yeah, a lot of food for thought this week and a lot of great links in the description below. I know a lot of the stories this week might be politicized or controversial, so Hopefully it doesn't get too wild in the comments, but I look forward to seeing your input, your likes, dislikes, all that stuff always helps with the YouTube algorithm. So I always appreciate the interaction, you guys. And I will definitely see you next Friday if I don't see you with another video first. So I appreciate your time with me here today. And as always, thanks for watching.